2004 was a huge year in pop culture. In television, we would see the final season of Friends. Meanwhile, in music, Kanye West released his first studio album, The College Dropout. Meanwhile, over in the world of wrestling, it was out with the old and in with the new, because while some big stars were about to leave for the foreseeable future, new ones were ready to rise in their place. But how did it all happen? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into the entire story from start to finish in the WWE in 2004, A Year in Review. When we last left off, Triple H's reign of terror had strengthened with the introduction of Evolution. Brock Lesnar was standing tall as the WWE Champion over on SmackDown, and The Undertaker had mysteriously disappeared from TV after losing a Buried Alive match to Vince McMahon. And this would lead us into the Royal Rumble on January 25th where, in the world title pictures, the game would find himself defending against his old friend and foe Shawn Michaels in a last man standing match, all while the Beast was putting his title up on the line against a surprising challenger in Hardcore Holly. Before we get there though, the undercard would see Batista and Ric Flair defend the Raw Tag Team titles against the Dudley Boys, Rey Mysterio defeat Jamie Noble in a cruiserweight title match, and Los Guerreros come to blows when Eddie faced off against his nephew Chavo. Then after that, while Brock was predictably making short work of his challenger, Triple H and HBK would go for over 20 minutes before the champ finally came out on top. But that wasn't the last match of the night of course, no we still had the rumble itself to come. And here, after entering at number one and then lasting over an hour, it would be Chris Benoit who defied all the odds when he ended up being the last man left. So with him now having the choice of taking on either the Raw or SmackDown World Champion at WrestleMania, he'd have to ponder this carefully as the company headed into the second pay-per-view of the year, No Way Out, on February 15th. And with this one being a blue brand exclusive, it would focus on the final challenger for the WWE Champion prior to WrestleMania. But who was this challenger? Well, after winning a battle royal to earn the number one contendership spot on the January 29th episode of SmackDown, it would be Eddie Guerrero who challenged Brock here. Aside from that, the rest of the card would see Rikishi and Scotty Tuhati successfully defend their WWE Tag Team titles against the Basham Brothers, Chavo Guerrero win the Cruiserweight title after beating Rey Mysterio, and Kurt Angle get a big time win over both John Cena and The Big Show in a triple threat match. Still, for as big as these bouts were, it was the main event people were really interested in, as after overcoming numerous addiction issues and rebuilding his life, Latino Heat had finally worked his way up to the main event picture. That said, with this being only a month away from the showcase of the Immortals, and the heavy speculation being that Brock Lesnar was going to face Goldberg for the title there, few expected Eddie to win this one. And that's what made it so magic then when, after just under 30 minutes, he'd hit a frog splash and score the pinfall, all before jumping into the crowd to celebrate with his people in one of the most feel-good moments in WWE history. Yes, after so many years of struggling, Eddie was now at the top of the mountain as WWE Champion. But he couldn't rest easy though, because just one month later at WrestleMania, he'd have to put that title on the line against Kurt Angle. Before we'd get there though, the Hall of Fame would make a return for the first time in nearly two decades, with this new class including major names like Harley Race, superstar Billy Graham, Jesse the Body Ventura, and Bobby Heenan. But that was just the start of a packed weekend, because the very next night, on March 14th, WrestleMania 20 would take place from the company's spiritual home base of Madison Square Garden. And here, after the show had started with a bang with John Cena defeating the big show to win the United States title, things would get even wilder as Trish Stratus turned heel by aligning herself with Christian. The Rock had his last WWE bout for almost a decade when he teamed with Mick Foley to take on Randy Orton, Batista, and Ric Flair, and Molly Holly was shaved bald after losing to Victoria in a hair vs. hair match. Then, in the first of many main events, Brock Lesnar and Goldberg would finally go one-on-one, -on -one, with the stipulation here being that, as neither man could be trusted to have a clean fight, Stone Cold Steve Austin was brought in to be the special guest referee. Unfortunately for everyone involved, however, it would leak out to the public prior to the bout that both Lesnar and Goldberg were planning to leave WWE after this one, with Brock in particular growing tired of the brutal schedule being demanded of him. So with fans realizing this, they'd rain down booze on the whole thing, causing each man to look visibly pissed throughout it and put no effort in as a result. Luckily though, the next main event would go better, as after having disappeared from the company for a while following the prior November Survivor Series, The Undertaker would make his triumphant return to face off against his brother, Kane. 
But this wasn't the biker incarnation of Mark Calloway which fans had grown used to over the last couple of years. No, much to their delight, this was the return of the dead man, complete with Paul Bearer by his side. So as the live audience lost their minds at seeing the Phenom come back to WWE after five years, he was only too happy to lay waste to his brother in just under seven minutes, taking his streak to 12-0 in the process. And with that done, it was left to the two world title matches, the first of which saw Eddie Guerrero successfully defend against Kurt Angle in characteristically dastardly fashion. Then, with fans pumped up over this, the last bout of the night would see Triple H defend the World Heavyweight title against not only Royal Rumble winner Chris Benoit, but also Shawn Michaels. And the reason for that was, with him and the game's feud still being left unresolved, he'd managed to insert himself into the whole situation. That said, he wouldn't end up walking away with the gold here as, after just over 24 minutes, it would be the Crippler who tapped out the champ so as to become the new top dog on Raw. But even that wasn't the end of the night because once this was done and Benoit was holding his newly won belt, his real-life best friend Guerrero would join him in the ring, as from there, the two celebrated together in a moment which, while magical at the time, has since pretty much been erased from history due to future events. Right then, though, no one knew what was to come, and so while Eddie continued to reign tall on the blue brand, Benoit would head into the next big Raw exclusive show of the year, April 18th's Backlash, ready to defend against Triple H and Shawn Michaels again in the rematch. Of course, with this event being in his home country of Canada, there was no chance he was going to lose the title here. And that was why, after a bout which was arguably even better than the first, he'd find himself coming out on top when he tapped out HBK with a sharpshooter. But that wasn't all that was going on on this show, as elsewhere, not only would Chris Jericho get a small measure of revenge over his former kayfabe girlfriend Trish Stratus and her new lover Christian, but Mick Foley would put his ongoing beef with Randy Orton to bed when the two went to war in a now legendary hardcore match over the Intercontinental title. Yes, this was the one which saw the legend killer fully prove he had what it took to be a main event force, as after beating Foley, his slow burn rise to the top continued to build momentum. That said, this storyline would have to be placed on the back burner for the next month because, since Raw had gotten backlash as a red brand exclusive, May 16th's Judgment Day would be SmackDown only. And this show would center on the WWE title feud between Eddie Guerrero and the newly rebranded JBL, with the former Bradshaw getting huge heat here by going after Latino Heat's Mexican heritage. Of course, given the nature of the storyline then, most expected the champ to come out of this one retaining. And while he did do this, the bigger concern by the close of the bout would be his health, as after taking a brutal chair shot mid-match, he'd lose a scary amount of blood, enough to where he'd need an emergency transfusion after things were over. But that's not the only notable thing which happened at this show, as elsewhere, The Undertaker would continue to re-establish himself as the big dog over on SmackDown when he scored a victory over Booker T, all while John Cena's rise picked up even more momentum when he defended his US title against Rene Dupree. And since they'd missed out this month, Raw would be happy to finally get their next pay-per-view, Bad Blood, on June 13th, during which Chris Benoit pulled double duty by not only teaming with Edge to challenge the World Tag Team Champions La Resistance, but also by successfully defending his World Heavyweight title against Kane. On top of that, Trish Stratus would win the women's title in a fatal four-way match that also featured Victoria, Lita, and Gail Kim, Randy Orton would defend the Intercontinental title against Shelton Benjamin, and fan favorite underdog Eugene would get his first pay-per-view victory when he pinned Jonathan Coachman. Then in the main event, Triple H and Shawn Michaels would finally put their beef to bed when they battled it out inside of Hell in a Cell, with Triple H coming out the victor here after 47 hard-fought minutes. So with that now over, each man could move on. But while Triple H was getting into a mini feud with Eugene over on Raw, and Shawn Michaels was segueing away from the main event scene for a while, SmackDown would also find themselves hosting their own pay-per-view this month as, for the first time, each brand put on a big event within the same 30-day period. So it was that, on June 27th at the Great American Bash, John Cena would start off the show by successfully defending his US title against Booker T, Rene Dupree, and Rob Van Dam in a fatal four-way match. Following this, Kurt Angle, who was then serving as the temporary general manager of the blue brand following an injury, would stand in the corner of newcomer Luther Reigns when he made short work of Charlie Haas. Then after that, the big WWE title rematch between Eddie Guerrero and JBL would take place. This time though, having learned from his prior loss, the challenger would be prepared for Latino heat once the bell rang, 
And that was why, after just over 19 minutes of their Texas Bull Rope match, he'd outcheat the cheater and shock everyone by becoming the new WWE Champion. But there was still more to come because, once the live crowd had a chance to let this sink in, they'd have to deal with an even bigger shock, as following his defeat of the Dudley Boys in a handicap match, The Undertaker would say goodbye to his longtime manager Paul Bearer when he buried him under six feet of cement. And now liberated from his manager then, the dead man would be free to focus on being the new number one contender to JBL's title at SummerSlam. Before we'd get there though, we'd have one more stop for the Raw brand, as on July 11th, they'd host Vengeance. Of course here, while the undercard saw Batista's slow rise continue with a victory over Chris Jericho, Edge become the new Intercontinental Champion after pinning Randy Orton, and Matt Hardy and Kane take their feud over Lita to pay-per-view, the main event would be all about Triple H's last chance to get a shot at Chris Benoit and his World Heavyweight title. So realizing that this was all or nothing, the game threw everything at the champ, but while this would force Benoit to dig deeper than he ever had before, it wouldn't be enough to see H get the win, as after an interference spot from Eugene towards the end of the bout, the champ would be able to execute a quick roll-up. And that then would finally lead us into SummerSlam on August 15th where, looking for revenge against the kayfabe nephew of Eric Bischoff, Triple H would take on Eugene one-on-one. -on -one. But that wasn't even half of what was going on during this card because elsewhere, Kane would score a victory over Matt Hardy, something which, as per the pre-match stipulation, meant Lita would be forced to marry him on a subsequent episode of Raw. Then, as if that wasn't wild enough, John Cena and Booker T would start out a very successful Best of Five series with a victory for the Doctor of Thugonomics, Edge retained the IC title in a triple threat match against Batista and Chris Jericho, Kurt Angle came back from injury to have a classic against Eddie Guerrero, and JBL managed to retain the WWE title on a technicality after The Undertaker got himself disqualified during their bout. But in the main event, the champion would not be so lucky because when Chris Benoit stepped in the ring with number one contender Randy Orton, he'd quickly realize his time had finally run out. And so, after just over 20 minutes then, it would be the legend killer who was able to do what Triple H could not when he pinned Benoit to become the youngest ever world champion in WWE history at just 24. Not that he'd have long to celebrate this though, because the very next night on Raw, furious that his protege had one upped him, the game would kick the new champ out of evolution. And this would set up the main event for Unforgiven on September 12th, where the two now former stablemates would fight it out over the brand's top prize. But before that though, the undercard would see Chris Jericho get the better of Christian in a ladder match for the Intercontinental title, a title which had to be vacated weeks prior to this when Edge suffered a groin injury. Then in the main event, Triple H would prove he was still the man when, after 24 minutes and 47 seconds, he'd pick up a screwy pinfall over Orton, ending his world title run at just 28 days as the game started his own ninth reign on top. Yes, if you thought the Reign of Terror was over, you were very wrong, because in spite of it all, H still ruled the roost on Raw for the time being. Meanwhile though, as all of this was happening, over on SmackDown they'd have other things to worry about as they were preparing for October 3rd's No Mercy. And what did this show entail? Well, the undercard would see the blue brand attempt to create some new stars as Luther Reigns got a chance to shine against Eddie Guerrero in a singles match, and Rene Dupree and Kenzo Suzuki were able to defeat Rob Van Dam and Rey Mysterio for the WWE Tag Team titles. Of course, that wasn't to say the main event players didn't get a spot too, as later on in the show, The Big Show and Kurt Angle would go one-on-one, -on -one. John Cena and Booker T would close out their Best of Five series with another victory for the Doctor of Thugonomics, and in the main event, JBL would once again successfully defend against The Undertaker, proving to everyone that he was more than just a paper champion. Sure, he may have been battered and bloodied by the end of it, but a win was a win nonetheless. And this ultimately meant that, heading into Survivor Series in November, he'd have to face a new challenger in the form of Booker T. Before we'd get there though, Raw would also get to host a pay-per-view in October, with this one having the gimmick that all the matches would be voted on by fans. Yes, this was the first edition of Taboo Tuesday on October 19th a weekday show which gave fans three options to choose from when it came to things such as stipulations and opponents for each bout. And that would all lead to some interesting situations throughout the night, as after being chosen to face Chris Jericho for the Intercontinental title early on in the show, Shelton Benjamin would actually go on to win the belt, making fans feel like they were having a say in the company's booking decisions. 
On top of this, we get Gene Snitsky taking on Kane in a Weapon of Choice match, with this one coming about after Kane had Kayfabe kidnapped and impregnated Lita, only for Snitsky to unintentionally then cause her to have a miscarriage, and no, we're not going to go into that whole can of worms here. Instead, we'll focus on the rest of the card, where Chris Benoit and Edge will become World Tag Team Champions when they were chosen to face off against La Resistance, and Eugene would get to shave Eric Bischoff's head, as per the fans' desires, after scoring a pinfall over him. But those bouts were all place setting for the two main events, because here, we would see Shawn Michaels get one more shot at Triple H and the World Heavyweight title after those voting decided he was worthy, and Randy Orton face off against Ric Flair inside a steel cage. And while Orton would win this latter bout, it didn't mean the night was a wash for Evolution, because at least the game would retain during his match. What he didn't realize at the time, though, was that the seeds of his ultimate destruction were already being sown, as on a subsequent episode of Raw, it would appear that Batista had turned on his leader, with this move drawing a huge reaction from the live crowd in attendance. Yes, it ultimately did turn out to be a trick Evolution was playing on Randy Orton, but taking note of how fans reacted to this, Vince McMahon would begin making plans for a big showdown the following year. Back in 2004, though, the next big show would be November 14th Survivor Series, a show where, with both Raw and SmackDown performers being on the card, we'd get to see the best of both worlds. And that led to a series of matches where, while Shelton Benjamin was continuing his Raw Intercontinental title run with a victory over Christian, over on the blue brand side, The Undertaker was making short work of Heidenreich in a one-on-one -on -one match. Then after this, we'd get to see two world titles defended when Trish Stratus scored a victory over Lita in the women's division, and JBL, with the help of his cabinet, weaseled his way into getting another win in the men's when he took on Booker T. And of course, as was the tradition with this event, we'd also get to see two Survivor Series elimination matches, as over on the SmackDown side, Team Guerrero, made up as they were of Eddie Guerrero, The Big Show, Rob Van Dam, and John Cena, would defeat Team Angle, with this team including Kurt Angle, Mark Jindrak, Luther Reigns, and Carlito. Then over on the Raw Brands bout, fans would watch as Team Orton, made up of Randy Orton, Chris Benoit, Chris Jericho, and Maven, got the win over Team Triple H, with them being made up of the game, Batista, Edge, and Gene Snitsky. So with this done, and the Triple H-Orton feud now finally seeming like it could be put to bed for the time being, it meant that Raw could begin to start the build for the Royal Rumble in January. As for SmackDown, however, they'd have one more show to get yet, because on December 12th, they'd host the final pay-per-view of the year, Armageddon. And this one would see some pretty heated bouts take place as it happened, because after Carlito had gotten his henchman Jesus to kayfabe stab John Cena in a nightclub a few weeks prior, the Doctor of Thugonomics was out for revenge. Needless to say then, he did come out the victor by the end of his match with Jesus that night, as did the Big Show when he defeated Kurt Angle, Luther Reigns, and Mark Jindrak in a 3-on-1 handicap match. Elsewhere, meanwhile, two young Tough Enough competitors would get their first chance to shine on a pay-per-view when Daniel Pewter took on and defeated Mike Mizanin in a Dixie dogfight. And while it would be Mizanin who went on to greater fame as the years went on, at this moment, you wouldn't have known it by looking at him as, being greener than grass still, it was still clear he had a lot of work to do yet if he wanted to become a top guy. Of course, if he'd watched the main event of the show, he would have learned a lot from those involved, because there, JBL would defend the WWE title in a fatal four-way match against Eddie Guerrero, Booker T, and The Undertaker. But still, despite the odds against him being overwhelming, the champ would manage to retain again by the time the closing bell had rung on this one, and this meant he'd get to have the honor of closing out the year as the top dog on the blue brand, because another brief visit to Iraq for a tribute to the troops show on December 18th aside, this would mark the end of WWE's year. Had it been a perfect year? No, in fact it was clear by this point, with the Monday Night Wars being fully in the rearview mirror, much of what was happening on screen lacked the same excitement it had a couple of years prior. That said, it doesn't mean there weren't a lot of positives too, because even if big stars like Brock Lesnar and Goldberg had gone, and Triple H was continuing his stranglehold over the Raw brand, the next generation were coming along nicely, with Randy Orton in particular reaching the main event level here. And as we moved into 2005, that pattern would only continue, because just a few months later, two of the defining stars of the Ruthless Aggression era would have world titles around their waists as well. But that's a story for another day, as this is where we're going to cut things off for now, safe in the knowledge that what was going to happen over the next 12 months would shape ultimately what the company became across the next generation.